do let us know and um but well, probably Ben that will answer. I can answer a few of the wine questions, but Ben will definitely be your man for the cheese. So just a little bit about um, cheese and wine matching. Um, it's going to start off a little bit negative, but it really does improve, so don't worry. Um, I'm going to start by saying matching cheese and wine can be really tricky because um, everybody always thinks that cheese and wine is this marriage made in heaven, but cheese is actually quite high in fat. Um, this is the only time we're going to mention that because afterwards we're just going to gloss over this bit because cheese is one of the major food groups. Um, this can actually coat the taste buds and make it really hard to taste your wines. And it's the acidity in cheese as well. So when you're trying the cheese, um, when nobody's looking, just take a little bit and mush it around the roof of your mouth so that you can really kind of feel all the kind of elements to the cheese. And you'll find that actually the acidity in cheeses, and especially in kind of cheeses such as goat's cheese or feta, it's really very high and it can make um, oaky or tannic wines taste really bitter. If you've got very strongly flavored cheeses, you've got to be quite careful because they can really overpower more delicate wines. So, you know, that kind of idea that you save your, um, your best, very expensive mature claret to drink alongside your really good quality, powerful, gutsy English cheddar, it will completely, the cheddar will completely wipe out the wine. So it'll end up having been a waste of your um, time and effort. Um, mild to hard cheeses for um, the kind of wine such as your claret, such as Comte or Gouda are actually much better with such wines. As a general rule, um, what goes together great together so if any of you have actually been to our um, food and wine events in Stevenage you'll hear that we say this all the time so to put this into context you have um, cheeses like Epois work really well with Burgundy, Munster works brilliantly with Alsace Gewürztraminer so if you're in doubt look at where your cheese naturally comes from and see if you can match it with a wine that comes from the same area. White wine as I'm sure you all know by now almost always works better with cheese than red wine does. Um, this is because white wine tends to have more fruit flavors and more acidity, which helps to really cut through the fattiness and the richness of the cheese. And it also helps to match up with the acidity in the, um, in the cheese as well. So um, the fruit helps to work with the saltiness that you tend to find in the cheese. On this note, sweet and fortified wines work really, really well. Um, the sweetness in the wine tends to work really well with the saltiness in the cheese. So um, kind of for this, think of things like salted caramel. Um, whether you go for a sweet wine or a more powerful fortified wine, it really does depend on how full flavored your cheese is. So do remember when it comes to anything with food and wine matching, balance is key. If you put something very, very full flavored with something which is much milder or lighter, one is gonna dominate the other. So you've got to try and get them so they're kind of on a similar flavor profile. Um, so you could go for, for coming up to Christmas, even if it's Christmas in lockdown where we're all on our own, you could have a little piece of um, Stilton with um, a little glass of vintage port. Um, but if you put a vintage port with a more delicate blue, something like the Forme d'Ambert or Gorgonzola, you might find that, that the port overpowers. So for those kind of cheeses, something like a Sauterne or a Muscat Bone de Venise would be a much better match. And then again with fortified wines, have a think about the flavours. So in fortified wines, you quite often get flavours of things like fruit and dried, um, dried fruit and nuts. These are also mirrored in wines such as Sherry, Tawny Port and Madeira. So the wines that you would, the cheeses you would naturally think of putting a little bowl of um, dried fruit and nuts alongside the cheese, such as a mature cheddar or a hard cheese, you can put those kind of wines alongside them instead. Madeira works really, really well because it's got such high acidity. So it helps to really cut through the, the richness of the cheese. And um, it also keeps for ages in the fridge as well. So it's kind of, it's a bit of a staple go-to um, for over this period. So I'm now gonna pass over, we're gonna start talking about the goat's cheese. So if any of you have got a Sauvignon Blanc um, in front of you, 
now would be the time to pour yourself a, um, a relatively large glass. After all, it is a Thursday night. And I'm going to pass over to Ben, who's um, hopefully there, and he's going to tell you a little bit about the goat's cheese that we've got. And then I'm going to come back and tell you about why we've decided to match the goat's cheese with the Sauvignon Blanc. Ben, are you there? Yes, I am. Excellent. Hello, everyone. I'm Ben. I'm from the Fine Cheese Company. I'm going to uh, talk you through your cheese this evening, um, starting with uh, the goat's cheese, uh, which is Petit Valencé. Um, so Petit Valencé is a lactic set, um, ash-coated goat's cheese. It's raw milk, um, and it's from the Loire Valley. Um, we generally say that um, a lactic set cheese um, is a moussey texture. Um, and you get quite citrusy notes um, from um, a lactic set cheese. Um, within the Loire Valley, you have famous cheeses such as Samour, um, you have Salsichere, um, and you have uh, Valencé. And this is a smaller Valencé being uh, Petit Valencé. Um, each cheese, so Salsichere, Samour, uh, Valencé, have to be made within um, that region of the Loire. Um, so, as you may know, um, with a lot of um, goat, um, well, with cheeses in, in general in, in France, um, the, the, they've for a long time now been owned by cooperatives. So lots of different farms um, will be, um, producing their milk um, and they'll be sending them to um, a, um, a fruitier or fromagerie um, and they will be collecting the milk and they will be making some more in some more. They'll be making Valencé in Valencé um, and they'll be making salsa share in salsa share. Um, where we get our Valencé from um, is right in the middle of, of um, these three places. Um, so um, we, we buy our uh, goat's cheese from um, a fromagerie called Jacquin. Uh, Jacquin, um, they get all of this milk in and then they make uh, these three really famous goat's cheeses um, from, uh, from the Loire. Um, they are all lactic set. Um, and when I say lactic set, I mean they're not using rennet um, to coagulate. They're using cultures um, that come in um, just after um, you have your milk, you put your cultures in, um, and within 22 to 24 hours, um, your cheese will slowly coagulate um, using that lactic, lactic acid bacteria um, to produce um, your curds and whey. And that's what gives it a really moussey texture. Um, the ash coat uh, comes um, right at the end. Um, here on the pictures, sorry, um, this is the this is salting here. So within the salting, so sorry. So this is um, ladling. So you have your vats, as you can see, um, and the ladle in the hand. Uh, the hand ladling. Um, the softer you ladle your cheese, the um, the more the proteins um, tend to stick together. You don't want to be messing around with those with those proteins and and pulling them apart. Um, making a, a much firmer cheese. You want to keep them all nice and snug. Um, so you hand ladle. Um, and you can see here they're making salsa share, uh, which is a dish shape. It's like a, a hockey puck. Um, so they're making salsa share uh, from the vats. And on the next page, um, you'll see they're making um, their salting. So within salting, they put ash. With a soft cheese, you salt on the outside and you mix the ash if you want your, your cheese to be ashed. Um, but with a hard cheese, um, you have the salt on the inside. So when you're, um, when you're cutting your cheese and when you're milling in a, in a really dry cheese, you're putting the salt into the cheese to dry out more moisture. But within a soft cheese, um, it's much more beneficial to put the, the salt and the ash on the outside, which dries the outside. Um, and obviously gives this lovely coat. Um, after salting, they put them into a hastening room, which is a really high humidity, uh, temperature about 15 to 17 degrees, which really brings on the rinds of, um, of the Valencé and Salsichere. Um, after that, about a week later, 
um, you get, as you can see um, in this picture. Um, this in the hastening room in Jacan, which I visited last year. Um, after, after it's been in there for a week, it'll go into maturing room, so less humidity um, and um, less temperature. So maybe 12, 12 to maybe 10 to 12 degrees, um, and it'll be left in there for another two weeks. So we, re we receive our um, fresh goat cheese, lactic set goat cheeses around three weeks old. And then depending on our customers, um, we'll send them out about three weeks, four weeks old, um, up until six, seven weeks. Um, and, you'll, and you'll find a lot of people like a really, like, like, like really fresh lactic goat's cheese. Um, but the French really like their goat's cheese mouldy. Um, they, they like, um, they like a, a thick rind. They like all of those moulds that have been uh, going around in the um, in the maturing rooms, they like them attached. They like them um, a lot more dense. Um, and you'll find this it, it's it's springy in texture, but the further it develops, it is the 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 more dense it, it gets. And it's so fresh. And you can see from the outside, there's a slight bit of breakdown, which we would call breakdown from the rind to the paste. And the more it matures into the middle of the cheese and um, the more dense and more fruitful it becomes. And I don't feel I, I don't find that too citrusy. I, I find it um I don't know how to explain it. How, Emma, how, how would you explain the, the taste of Valencia? Um, For me, it's got this kind of slightly chalky flavour to it, which I absolutely love. And then there's that kind of, um, it is a little bit citrusy. It's a little bit, now this is going to sound really strange. I always find them a little bit goaty. Um, you can tell it's come from the goat. And it's that fresh acidity, that little bit of chalkiness and that kind of little bit of fruity kind of citrusness as well. Somebody has been asking, Ben, what yeah. do they use? What do they burn to get the ash? It's just vegetable ash. Vegetable ash. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's just general. They, they will, they, they won't burn it themselves. It will be um, a sterile vegetable ash that they will purchase. Um, that they will use along with the salt. Uh, and salt, they use rock salt. I have to admit, I finally succumbed and I've dug in. It's really lovely and gooey, my, my goat's cheese. Yeah, it's really... And it does have that really lovely creaminess to it, but there's always that kind of slight earthiness there as well. Yeah, you definitely get... I, I find to get, like, stones and, like, rocks through it, that... that um, I guess that terrain that you have in the, the Loire, um, especially, you know, you, ha you have the, the beautiful river there with, with the goats, you know, grazing along the riverbed. And, and I find that in, in you know, Celsichere, um, Valencia and, and Samor, for sure. Yeah, it's true. It's, um, it's kind of a bit the same way as we always talk about with the wines. You know, you have a, a sense of place, a terroir in the wine, and it's the same with the cheese, isn't it? So you were saying that this cheese has changed quite a lot since the first time I tried it because the goats have been eating slightly different grass. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, yeah, and especially you find that in a raw milk cheese. Um, you don't find it so much in a pasteurized cheese um, because the bacteria is taken out, um, the good bacteria is taken out of, uh, out of the cheese. So you don't taste what the cow has been grazing on or the goats been grazing on, or the sheep or the buffalo. Or, um, and that's, that's why, you know, we, we, we try and pride ourselves on, on raw, especially raw milk, because that's where all the flavour is. So there's a couple more questions. Why do they coat the goat's cheese in ash? So is it's, it just fashion or? It's tradition, basically. Okay. It, is, it is just tradition uh, and what they, what they did. Um, people say that they did it because of acidity within the milk. And so ash would um, level out the acidity, um, which it, 
you know, it marginally does, but we don't have such a problem these days with controlling milk and controlling um, where your, you know, goats are grazing or, and, and then it became a tradition. And, and basically it's ash now because it's within the PDO. So these cheeses have a specific recipe and they have to be made. And I don't know whether Ben's just frozen, but um, somebody else is saying that, um, why is unpasteurized milk more flavorsome? I think That's sadly like he, Ben may have frozen Emma. I have but, to um, say, I think he might have lost I him briefly. <laughs> but I do know that Catherine so has the wines. Shall I share the wine screen up with you? And you can maybe um, talk a little perfect. bit about the wine. And I'll talk a little bit quickly about um, why I've put the two together. And then hopefully we'll get Ben back. Otherwise, I'm going to have to um, start thinking very quickly about any cheese facts I know. Um, so the reason um, we put the goat's cheese with the Sauvignon Blanc is because the classic match for, um, well, it's the Cratin de Chavignol and Sancerre, which is the absolute classic. Um, it works because, again, if you, if any of you have got goat's cheese in front of you, if you have another little bit of goat's cheese, um, you'll find that the, the slight chalky texture, chalky, chalky flavour to the goat's cheese, gives it quite a drying sensation. That and the really high acidity and that kind of slight chalky minerality, they just work really well together with the Sauvignon, especially Sauvignon from the Loire. And... Um, and the cheese, the goat's cheese from the same area. Um, goat's cheese can be quite delicate in flavour, so you wouldn't want to put it with, um, so for example, I've got the Gigal Cote de Rhone. If you put the Gigal Cote de Rhone with the goat's cheese, you would just taste the Gigal Cote de Rhone, which would be a total shame, um, although it is a nice wine, obviously. Um, if you wanted to go for a red wine, you could always have gone for something like a Cabernet Franc from the Loire. You're basically, you're looking for, in my head, and we all do very dramatically when it comes to cheese and wine matching, but um, for me, you're looking for something that has a little bit, something that's quite dry, which has got a kind of greenness to the fruit, so a kind of herby mineral note there. And for those of you who aren't sure what we mean by minerality, I used to say that you could pick minerality up if you licked a railing, but people honestly thought that I went around doing that. So um, we changed it. And if you lick the back of a teaspoon, it's that kind of um, zingy, sparky, almost electrical feeling that you get on your tongue. That's what we're talking about when we refer to minerality. And I think you can pick it up, those of you who've got the Petit Valencé, I think you can pick it up in that, but you can also pick it up in, um, in the wine as well. And I think if you go for a wine, again, this is personal, if you go for a wine that's just really, really overtly fruity and really plump, you end up losing a little bit of that, um, that minerality and it just all becomes a little bit fat, if that makes sense. Now, do we have Ben back at all? Or um, have we still lost him? We're trying Can't to get Bam Ben, ben <laughs> back, brother. There we go. There he is. I'm yeah, so there sorry. He is. Don't I'm worry. It nowhere. happens to all I'm of us. <laughs> so, what do you think of the pairing? Um, I really love it. I, I, I really like him. Um, I'm going to try it again. I've been trying. I've been messing around with that internet for the last five minutes. So, Ben, we were going to ask you with a cheese like this you know, these cheeses that come in, they're a very particular shape. How are you supposed to cut them up? Because I know, I mean, it's a few years ago now, um, I got really shouted at at a dinner party for nosing the brie. Um, so it's something I would never ever dare do again. Actually, I don't even cut cheese anymore. I just let somebody else do it in case I make another social faux pas. But um, how would you cut the, something like a little pyramid so that you don't just get all outside? Oh, 
Let's say we've lost him again. I think we might have lost him, Emma, but I think actually I'm conscious of time anyway. So how about if it's okay with you, we move on to wine number two and you tell us a little bit about that and we'll try and get Ben's internet connection back up and running. Excellent. In that. which case I will we'll kind of turn everything on its head and rather than Ben starting off with the um, talking about the Bloomy Rhine cheeses, I'll, um, I'll talk about why we put the Rhine, the Bloomy Rhine cheeses um, kind of in terms of food and wine matching. So um, Bloomy Rhine cheeses, these can range from kind of being kind of mild and slightly chalky to really, really decadently gooey and quite strong in flavour. And this really does depend on how mature the cheese is. So you do need to take this into consideration a little bit when you choose what wine you want to put with your, um, with your cheese. Um, quite often you can get a slightly earthy note to the cheese and you can pick up on these flavours by pairing the Bloomy Rhine cheeses with something like a Pinot Noir or a Chardonnay that also have this um, slight earthiness to them. The most important thing is to pick a wine that's got lots of fruit because tannic reds tend to clash with the kind of the chalky, creamy, mouth coating gooiness that you get at these cheeses. So for that reason, I put a Chardonnay with the match because I really like the fact that the creaminess in the Chardonnay is matched with the creaminess in the cheese. But you could also go for um, lighter reds like um, Beaujolais or a very kind of young and fruity and cheerful Cote de Rhone. Um, those kind of reds that have got kind of lots of fruit forward flavours, I think would work really well. And it's really interesting because um, I think Anna was saying that she absolutely, she really does, I think it's Chardonnay that she hates with Bloomy Rhine cheeses. Whereas I'm like, I really like it as a combination. So um, I'd be really interested to hear from you all as to whether it's working for you or not, whether you um, preferred, preferred something else instead. So the Bloomy Rhine cheese is the Baron Bygod, because um, Craig is saying, which cheese are you talking about? So it's the Baron Bygod um, or the, the Brie style cheese that um, we're talking about now with your, um, with, your, with your Chardonnay. If you've got a Chardonnay, but also do please try it with the other wines as well. How are we doing with Ben, Anna? Have we managed to get him oh, back or have we lost yet. him forever? So we're, we're working on a new solution. But what I would say is I feel like I need to defend myself on the, uh, <laughs> the dislike of the Bloomy Rind and Chardonnay. <laughs> um, it's not so much a dislike. It's that if the Chardonnay doesn't have enough acidity, I find the combination quite cloying. So for me, yeah. it has to be a very, very racy Chardonnay. And... I've sort of fallen victim too many times to a uh, fat, plump, um, perhaps lower acid wine. And then for me, yeah. it's just a terrible shame because everything just goes, oh. Um, so that's my personal. Bit, I completely agree with you, which is why I always end up going for something like a Macon or a Burgundy, depending on the budget and the night of the, the week or month it is. Um, because you naturally have that little bit more acidity there. And again, you've got that little bit of mineral quality there as well. Whereas if you went for a massively um, voluptuous Californian Chardonnay, then I could see it being, it all just becomes a little bit too much. So you want a wine and cheese pairing that you keep going back to and you keep having a little nibble of, rather than something that you go, oh, it's a bit like, oh, I can't manage anymore because I feel quite overcome. So I always find it's a little bit like Christmas pudding. And um, if you put that with a very kind of big, robust port or something, for me, it's just too much. I, I get wiped out by it. But something that's got really good acidity and lots of freshness, it kind of just keeps moving on, keeps things uh, light. Emma, I think hopefully we do have Ben back. Ben, yeah, I... Safe. No, don't worry. I was going to suggest, I think you're, um, if your internet's struggling with your video, Catherine actually already has the images for the next cheese, which we've, in your absence, we dare say, already started eating. <laughs> but uh, I wonder if you want to turn the video off, that might be easier and then people can look at the slides and then when you're ready to uh, chat, might, we might be able to hear you then if that's all right. 
Yeah, I, should I turn the video off and that may be better? I think so, just to um, allow your internet a little breathing space. Thank you. Um, yeah. And then Catherine will be able to share the slides and we can look at the lovely production of the cheese anyway. So Catherine, okay. when you have it, a moment. This is about the Baron Bygod now. So Baron Bygod made in Suffolk um, by Johnny Crickmore. Um, it's raw milk, um, traditional rennet. Um, it's England's take on um, breed and moe, basically. Um, so Johnny Crickmore, he, um, so he started out um, by, I don't know if you've seen, um, but there are lots of um, milk vending machines these days and, and they've come from Johnny Crickmore, basically. Um, he brought, he, he was the first salesman in England to bring, um, to bring um, milk vending machines over here. Um, and that's where he started basically his career in, um, in cheese making. Um, his uncle owned uh, a farm in Suffolk, which is Fen Farm, but before this, they'd, they'd never made cheese. Um, so after a while of, of selling, these, um, selling these vending machines, got a bit fed up and um, wasn't doing so well and, and decided to, um, decided to ha have a go at, at cheese making. Um, and he, he spoke to Neil's yard um, and, and basically asked them, you know, what are we missing in British cheese? Um, and they said, well, we're missing a, a traditional breed of mo. Um, and so Johnny being Johnny um, <laughs> went far and beyond, um, went over to France, um, learned about um, making breed of mo. Um, but not only that, bought himself 150 Montbelliard cows while he was there. Um, he ended up shipping these over um, to Suffolk, um, where he makes Baron Bygod. Um, Johnny's philosophy on cheese and, and cheese making comes down to his cows. Um, and he loves his cows um, more than anything. They have underfloor heating in their um, in their cow shed, um, so much so that um, the 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 heat that is provided within the underfloor heating from the cow pan within the cow shed is used for all of Fen Farms' um, basically heating requirements. And um, these are the Montbelliard cows. Um, their, their milk is absolutely stunning. You, you expect a bit more of a rich milk from Montbelliard. Um, Montbelia cows are, are used within Comte, Gruyere um, and Alpine cheeses. Um, so you would have a mix in Comte of, of cows, but Montbelliard would give you uh, that, more, that more rich taste. They give you a bit more of a yellow milk. Um, so within, um, within cheese making, um, they obviously, they, they have their uh, cow shed within um, their cow shed is basically right next to their, their making room. So we're talking about um, a few meters from where they get, um, where they get milked um, to where um, the cheese um, starts its process. Um, there, was a, there was a photo before that, that shows you the rind of the cheese. Um, and this is really important to Johnny. It's on, on, on Baron Bygod, you have this, you have this um, this fluffy coat on it, which is um, Penicillium candidum, um, and that gives you that really nice fluffy look of a cheese. Um, however, it can be it can be quite bitter, um, but it but it looks beautiful and it gives you a really nice coating on your cheese. However, if you look just further down on the side of the rind, um, where where the dark patch is you'll see there's like some, some wrinkles on the cheese. Uh, and this is geotrichum. Um, and geotrichum um, basically gives a real complexity to a cheese. Um, so these are all starter cultures um, that you put in. Um, and, and, and basically what Johnny's looking for is it's a beautiful mix between candidum and geotrichum. Um, so you have this beautiful coat um, so that the rind forms perfectly, but also not too much bitterness. And adding this geotrichum around it, 
which you'll find in patches um, to, to get this complexity. And you'll find where the geotrichum is within the paste of the cheese um, will be a lot denser and a lot more runny, but the candidum will give a more solid state to the cheese. So yeah, it, it's, a, it's a tricky business for him. And what do you think, Verna? Do you... I absolutely love this cheese. Do I. Um, I think of all the cheese, I mean, I love the goat's cheese as well, um, but there's something about this cheese that it just does make you just keep going back to it. And it's funny because somebody was saying that it makes the macon almost taste off dry um, because the macon, if you try it on its own, it's got a fair amount of acidity, but the acidity in the cheese, which is kind of, it's stealth acidity. You don't necessarily notice it when you first just try the cheese because it's so creamy. And then that kind of creamy and then that chalky, that chalky bloomy rind, it kind of, it just makes the wine taste kind of just a bit more fruity, um, which is a combination that I do really like. And that's why, as we were saying earlier with Anna, um, you trend, tend not to go for, you need to have a wine that's got the acidity. Otherwise, once you've stripped away the acidity in the wine, you end up with something that can feel a little bit flabby. Um, then somebody has been asking, why is the Baron Bygod called Baron Bygod? Where did the name come from? So it comes from a, uh, an old monastery um, just down the road in Bungie. So, so Johnny also does a product called uh, Bungie Butter. Um, so in Bungie, there is a, a monastery. Um, and in the monastery, there was a gentleman that was the Baron. And he was the Baron of Bygod, basically. And, and, and that's, that's where the name came from. And from the farm, if you walk up the hill, um, which is opposite the dairy, um, you can you can see all of Bungie and you can see the monastery on the top um, and that's that's where the name comes from basically. Amazing what do you think of the the cheese and wine combo does it work for you or? I I prefer it to the first one actually I am yeah. I, I get a, a much more harmonious um, I don't know um, I, I, I don't I don't think that the macon tastes acidic over the over the cheese. I think the cheese, I, I, I yeah, I just think they they work. I don't, I don't know how to explain it. It's, it's really it just works for you. It does really work for me. Yeah, that's all that matters. Um, another question that we've had was um, why does raw milk? Um, why is it more tasty than pasteurized milk? So. Okay. Oh, and Stephen, now there's a very cute dog that's just appeared as well. <laughs> so, um, raw milk is more tasty because it hasn't had the bacteria taken out of the cheese. So during pasteurization, which is basically, pasteurization is taking the, the milk up to temperature about 72 and a half degrees. Uh, and within that process, you're stripping out um, good bacteria, so flavours. Um, and you do this because that milk is much more controllable. You can do whatever you like and you can get an end product that's going to be the same every time. Um, and it's easier to manage. But within raw milk, it's much harder. You have this ever-changing, you know, product that you never, you, you never know when you put it into a fat. You don't know what's going to happen to it. You don't know what the acidity levels are. You have to manage your animals um, but the end product is much more complex and you get the flavors from the soil to the mouth to the palate and um, you don't get that with pasteurized milk but you do get that with raw milk because with raw milk you don't take out any bacteria fantastic thank you so much for explaining that because it's something i've often wondered about but um, it's quite hard to find people to ask um, so that's absolutely perfect. Do you fancy moving on now and um, talking about the, the cheddar cheese that yeah, we've cool. got here? Yeah, so next we have Westcombe. Um, so Westcombe is one of four um, cheddars within Somerset, which is, um, so Somerset cheddar, um, they're cloth bound, they're again, they're raw milk, 
Um, they're made, uh, th well, this one's made by, um, by Tom. Um, and um, basically they're, um, for, for, a, for a cheddar to be a, um, a Somerset um, unpasteurized cloth bound cheddar um, and have this, it's basically, it's called a Presidia. Um, and there, there are only four of them, and Westcombe are, are one of them. And Tom Carver, he, he makes one of the best. Um, he looks for the best within his, his soil, so he, he focuses massively on what he's feeding his, his cows to get the best out of, uh, out of his cheese at the, at the other end. Um, in this picture here, you can see Tom cheddaring, and, and lots of people wonder what cheddar is. Um, and cheddaring is a process. So, so the process, to put it really quickly, is you have your milk, you have your cultures, you have your rennet, um, you have your salting, um, you have your um, cutting of your curd, and then you have um, coagulation. And here you can see Tom has got um, his cheddar curds, and he is cheddaring at this point. Um, and cheddaring is a process of turning over the curds. So he puts them. Um, so he cuts them and then turns them and turns them and turns them. And he turns them to release moisture because in a cheddar you want a brittle texture. And um, so all cheddars will have been cheddared. So it's not because it's from Cheddar Valley or Cheddar Gorge or whatever, it, whatever it's called. It, it's because it's, it's had this process of turning. And um, so that's what he's doing um, in this picture. Again, as I said previously with Valence, um, the salting on the outside of that. But with cheddar, it's really important that you salt the inside of the cheese. So you have really small curds. Um, you put them all together and you salt the inside. It draws more moisture out because you want a dry cheese and cheddar is a dry cheese. You'll find within the four cheddars, so we have Keene's cheddar, Montgomery's, Pitchfork uh, and Westcombe. Um, and you'll find with it, within all of them, they're all made in Somerset, um, but they all taste completely, completely different. And that's because of the terroir that we're talking about before in France. You have it exactly the same um, in Britain. Um, and this will be Tom here, he's, uh, he's grading his cheese. Um, so we go and select our cheddars. We go and select quite a lot of our cheese, but this is a, an example of Tom doing it here. Um, so what we're looking for is, basically what our customers expect um, of our cheddar. So we have um, a, a flavor profile in mind, which is it, it, in, in Westcombe, we find it, um, we find it fruity. We don't find it um, earthy and deep like Montgomery's. We find it fruity and bright um, and a little more dry than you would find in something like Pitchfork or Keens. Um, and we like it a fairly high acidity level um, within Westcombe. Um, so he's using a cheese iron there um, to grade his cheese. Um, so we go and do that and, and, so, and so do Neil's yard. In this picture here, um, you're seeing um, basically larding. So they use port lard on the outside of a cheddar um, after molding. And they use port lard and then they wrap around um, cheesecloth, um, as you expect on a cloth bound cheddar and um, that's been matured in Somerset. Um, you can't just stick um, uh, the cheesecloth to, to the side of the cheese. You, it has to be stuck by something. And traditionally it's port lard. Um, so all your cloth bound cheddars will be, um, will be bound with, with port lard as well, which also adds to the flavor. It's really important with cheddar as well, when you're eating it, that you eat from the outside in. It's super important because they taste, it just tastes so different. If you taste near the rind and then you taste in the center, it's like a completely different cheese. I, th I, I think that's super important. What do you think, Amy? You, you were talking to me about that before, weren't you? Yeah, again, I think I'm just a cheese fanatic, actually. Um, this is another one of those food groups. Um, it, 
it's just a lovely cheddar because it's actually a cheddar that's just got some real real flavor and real structure to it um I've been nibbling a little bit from down on the kind of the bottom of the point but um I think when I'm left to my own devices, I'm going to have to go and eat some from around the rind as well, because they tend to be my favourite bits where it's kind of much more full flavoured around the rind. I completely agree. It's because it's going, you know, it's maturing from the outside in. So um, was... and... Sorry. It's the video, isn't it? So somebody was asking, why don't you have, you know, what happens to the hole after you've punctured a hole into the cheese in order to kind of get your sample? You know, so you don't it, ever get a cheddar cheese with a great big hole in it. So we only do up, so we do, we do a hole maybe 10, 15 centimetres long and maybe a centimetre wide. And in, within that, we maybe take if there's a centimetre each and then we, put it back, it back in and then we make sure that there is there is no um, oxygen um, available to go back into the cheese so we rub it with cheese. Excellent um, so people don't have to worry about suddenly having a holy cheddar. No but you will you know if you're going to cheesemonger you, you are going to get those big pieces of cheese that will have iron marks but that's so we can ensure that the cheese is at its best quality so, you know, if, you, if you're ordering a, a kilo of cheese from us, or two kilos or three kilos, you may get an iron mark, but that's because we're testing the quality. We want to make sure it's good enough to send. Excellent, I love it. So somebody actually earlier was saying, um, because we talked about Californian Chardonnay, and we were probably a little bit rude about Californian Chardonnay when it came to the Bloomy Rhine cheeses, such as the Baron Bygard. They're saying, well, what would you put with a with a kind of big, full-bodied um, oaky chardonnay? And I think something like this cheddar, because the chard the thing about this cheddar is it's really quite full flavoured, which is why this cheddar, you know, the first time this evening we've moved on to the Cote de Rome, um, because you're wanting something with enough body and enough fruit to be able to cope with the the full flavour of the cheddar, but also that kind of that saltiness there as well. So anything with lots and lots of fruit, I think will work with the cheddar. So for the, um, the big full bodied Californian Chardonnay fans amongst you, do try them together as a combination. But for others, I do hope you're liking it with the Cote de Rome as well. Um, so, just to talk very quickly about kind of matching wine with cheddar and hard cheeses. These kind of cheeses are perhaps the easiest of all your cheeses to pair with wine. So it's salt that's in the cheese, which can really modify the perception of astringency and um, acidity. So the saltiness that's naturally present in the cheese can help to soften the perception of the tannins in a red wine. Um, and just kind of makes everything kind of very much softer and kind of really helps to bring out the fruit. Um, again, try and be careful that you don't go for a red that's overpoweringly tannic um, because there's nothing but time that can help to soften those tannins to settle down. Um, so as before, look for a wine that's got lots of fruit to it. Um, it helps to counterbalance the salt. Um, and we were talking again, you know, about the barrel fermented chardonnays. Fiona Beckett also says that um, barrel fermented chardonnay works really well. And if you haven't had a look at her website, she's got the most amazing website on food and wine matching. Um, so do, if you don't have one in front of you now, next time you do have a big kind of full bodied gutsy, uh, gutsy um, cheddar cheese, do try it with a big full bodied gutsy chardonnay as well, if you like that style of wine. So Ben, what do you think of these two together? Does this work for you? The the cheddar and the and the Cote Yeah. So I'm, I'm still playing catch up from from trying to go. Um, <laughs> it's a terrible position to be in on a Thursday night, isn't it? <laughs> See, I don't know. How about everybody else is watching? 
Are we going to get thumbs up or are we going to feed it to the lions? I don't, know if, the Westcom, I don't <laughs> know if the Westcombe doesn't stand up to the Cote d'Arene. You think the Cote d'Arene for you is a bit more overpowering? I think maybe. I'm going to try nearer the Rhine though. Just to Excellent. See. It's lovely because we've got... Um, my sorry, I should really be wearing my glasses this evening. I'm squinting at the screen. Um, there seems to be a kind of mixture. So some people are like, yeah, this is really working for me. And some people are going, oh, I'm not so sure. And mm. I think this is one of the joys of food and wine matching. So if you work out what works for you, and then especially in lockdown, there's no excuse. But if you, um, you just go for the wines that you think pair the best rather than what you're always being told ought to pair the best, because it's you that's putting it together. So, um, yeah. I completely agree. People always ask me, you know, what wine should I have with this cheese? And, and I say it's completely up to you. It's, it's so subjective. It's what Absolutely. Like. It's what, Absolutely. I'm, I'm, so I'm it, not going to tell you what, what, what you like and what, what you prefer with this wine. I can give you a general you know, idea, but I don't know. <laughs> Excellent. So much as I am enjoying that, should we move on to the blue? Mm -hmm. Do the yep. blue for the last one just kind of looked up at the clock and thought, hang on, <laughs> we better be careful we don't completely run out of time here. Yeah, no, I'll, I'll go really quick on the blue. Um, no, no, so, you don't need to. <laughs> I don't need to. So, um, yeah, so the last one is uh, Gongzola Picante. Um, so there are three Gongzolas. Um, there is Gongzola Dolce, which everyone generally knows. Um, there's Picante, which is obviously the, the, the spicier. Um, and then there's cachaya, which is spoonable. You might see it in a, in a big round with a with a big spoon in it. But um, but picante is what we've chosen this evening. Um, so our picante, um, so our picante is from an Afonia called Casa Ragoni. Uh, Casa Ragoni are in Val um, They're the, the the last Afonia um, in Val Val and um, they. So being an Afonia, they receive their cheese. They don't make the cheese, but they know how to look after it. Um, so a lot of fruitier and farmers in France will make their cheese and then send it. So they receive gorgonzola within two weeks. Gorgonzola is a pasteurized cheese. Um, it is blue, it is cow's milk, um, and it is also uh, brined. So they dip. Um, they dip the whole cheese in brine, which makes it a wash brine. So it's uh, a wash brine cheese, which gives it which gives it that real pun like pungency. So like a poisse or um, or Munster, as we were talking about earlier. Mm. Um, so the the blue within within Gorgonzola um, is different to the blue that you would have within. Um, Stilton or um, Form d'Ambert. Um, they use um, a blue called uh, Penicillium Glaucum, um, whereas otherwise it'd be Penicillium Roqueforti most of the time. Um, so as you can see here, it's got quite quite an orange rind. So the orange comes from the, the dip brining, so the wash rind. Um, and the white that you can see on the outside is Candidum, so Penicillium Candidum. Uh, which you found on uh, the Baron Bygod. And so you want that lovely outside, um, you know, that, that, um, that stability of candidum, but you also want the funkiness um, of, of the brine washing, which is usually bee linens. Um, so we, I, I would say within, within Picante, it is a, it's a strong cheese. It's a strong blue cheese, but it's, biscuity and I, I think that the, the milk levels out the amount of strength that you have within the blue. The older it gets the more spicy we say it gets. Um, I, I don't know if you, um, if, if you feel the blue it feels more um, viscous than you would expect. Um, the, the blue would be in, in a Stilton or something similar. Um, and also you, you will see that the blue lines go a different way. Um, so blue doesn't become blue until you add oxygen into the cheese. So a blue cheese um, is always 
or it, it's never a blue um, until you add oxygen. So you could have a, a full, an eight kilo Stilton um, and you would, you would add the blue cultures um, right at the beginning, but it would never become a blue cheese until four or five weeks later when you add oxygen by spiking into the cheese. So basically puncturing holes into the side of the cheese, which add oxygen to the cheese and then the blue blooms. So you see in, in this cheese, um, it has very definitive lines uh, and that's where, the, that's where the puncture holes have gone into the cheese to allow the oxygen into the cheese. Um, I'm just gonna taste it because I haven't tasted it yet. But I always find it quite biscuity. Emma, do you find it biscuity? What, what, what do you think of it? I'm actually, so I'm just pouring myself some Sauterne because I really love blue cheese and Sauterne as a combo. I'm a blue cheese novice because I grew up, my, my dad loves really full-bodied Stilton that's kind of so gutsy, it literally knocks your socks off. And um, I've always found that quite overpowering. It's kind of quite a hard way into, um, into eating um, blue, blue cheese. But this one, it's just a little bit easier to get on with, if that's fair to say. Do you think that's the milk? Or do you think that's, do you find, mm. do you find that yeah, if, you miss, if, you miss the, if you miss the blue, do you find that the, the, the milk is a lot more creamy than you would find in, in a Stilton? Is that what you find? Or? Mm. You're right on the biscuitiness though as well. What does everybody else think? If you tell us on the, um, on the chat. For me, yeah, it does have that almost kind of digestive biscuit um, character to it. It's lovely. It's a really nice blue cheese. I think it's a really and good combo. Has anybody got a... I'm sorry. Sorry? I think it's a really good combo. I really like that sauté with them. Mm. Whereas I think, for me, a port would probably be too full-bodied. Mm -hmm. um, so a little bit like some people have said with the Cote de Rhone. So some people have said the Cote de Rhone and the cheddar. For them, the Cote de Rhone is kind of slightly overpowering the cheddar. And for me, I think if you had something like a late bottle vintage port and you put it with a blue like this, you would lose the, the kind of the delicacy, the intricacies of the blue cheese. Yeah. And all you would really taste is the port. So for me, the Sauterne just works. It's that kind of perfect compromise. Yeah, I, I really love it. And, and again, with, with the cutting style, I, I, I like to cut from the center to the rind. So you always taste every single part of the cheese because it obviously it, it, the rind it is, it is wash rind, but in the center, it's still, you know, um, it's fairly young. Um, and it, it's just super interesting to, to taste cheese that way. Excellent. Actually, that, that does tie in with something that um, one of the members has asked, do you, eat the rind on every cheese? Should you eat the rind on every cheese? I'm presuming not your waxed cheeses, of course, but all the other kind of artisanal cheeses, should you be eating the rind or should you be avoiding it? So you should, there's never any reason to avoid them unless they're waxed. Um, however, um, with something like cheddar, you have a port lard that has been, um, matured for 12 months minimum um, and it's been cloth bound and so I wouldn't quite advise to eat the rind on um, on, on a cloth bound cheddar um, but I would eat as close to the rind as possible and um, with gouda for example I, I would again it's plasticated um, and so I would eat as close to the rind as I as I possibly can but with, with brie and with any natural rinded cheese, I would eat it all. Yeah. I, mm. and, and taste it at, at different, you know, at different occasions, as in I would taste the inside and, and, and taste and, you know, try some wine and then, you know, taste the outside near the rind and, and, and taste the wine because it's completely different. So I would eat as much rind as I can, but 
obviously be aware if, it, if it's too tough it doesn't taste great if it's a cheddar it's a gouda it's plasticated but apart from that eat, eat all round I would say Excellent. Um, so there's a few questions. Actually, there's been some very good cheese jokes that have come in. So if you've seen me kind of trying really hard not to burst out laughing, it's because cheese jokes are my absolute favourite thing. <laughs> um, so my favourite cheese joke is how do you coax a bear out of a cave? With a come um, on, bear. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> ben, have you got any good cheese jokes? Oh, uh... I'm put you on the spot. <laughs> You're too cool for school, you see. Oh, um, I don't, I don't, I don't, my, one of my colleagues, Martin, he comes in every day with a joke, it's a daily joke. Every, I mean, it's, it's not, it's not usually cheese related, but he's fab with that. <laughs> but we'll allow you to keep thinking. I, yeah. <laughs> Put you on the spot. Um, <laughs> Just looking because you've had quite a few. So the cheeses that we would nest, well, we would generally have with fortified wines. Um, for me, you need to go for a cheese that's is again, it's about balance. So it's about going for a cheese that's got lots and lots of body and um, which is really quite a powerful cheese on its own. Because fortified wines, because of the alcohol and the sweetness they tend to be very full bodied as well. Um, so if you're looking, I mean, fortified wines all do vary quite, quite a lot in terms of styles, but um, if you're looking at something like a late bottle vintage or a vintage port, Stilton does work really well. And um, Ben, as I'm sure you'll agree, the kind of really full bodied kind of proper British Stiltons, um, and lovely with, again, a kind of very full body, but also very sweet, which works against the salt in the Stilton. Absolutely, but we have to remember that, you know, Stilton is a type of cheese rather than a specific cheese. Um, within Thank Stilton, you. there are many, there, you know, there are many different Stiltons. Um, we, we stock predominantly Colston Bassett Stilton and Colston Bassett Stilton um, is a much more creamy, um, creamy, creamy blue cheese, I, I would say. And it's not that typical knockout Stilton that you, that you would expect. And your knockout Stilton, as we stock as well, is Crockwell Bishop. So we stock both, but, but Colston Bassett is our, is, our, is our prime Stilton uh, and Crockwell Bishop is, that, is what you would expect. You also... When you go to the supermarket, you buy Long Clawson Stilton, um, and there's also Hartington Stilton. So you can't when you when I think that's the thing when you pair something, you can say I pair it with cheddar or I pair it with Stilton, mm -hmm. but but actually there are there's so much variance within each cheese category. You know, you can say well, I want to do a, a territorial, but there are so many territorials. Um, yeah. So, so I completely agree with you, but um, that, that something like that would go well with a Stilton, but which Stilton, um, you know, I would have to, you know, I would send you every Stilton that we, that we have, so you could decide, you know, which one that you felt was, was best with, with your wine. I was going to say, bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds perfect. <laughs> um, no, you're absolutely right. And it's a bit like us talking about... Um, you know, from a wine point of view, saying, oh, well, Chardonnay works really well or Sauvignon works really well. It really depends on where the Chardonnay or the Sauvignon comes from. So, yeah, you're, you're, you're absolutely spot on there. Um, so just to kind of talk very quickly about blue cheeses and pairings for blue cheeses, and I do appreciate a few of you have said that you're quite happy for us to run over. So we are running over slightly, if that's OK. Um, so there are two wine pairings, blue cheese, that are so famous that it's really hard to see past them. So you've got Port and Stilton, Roquefort and Sautern. So wines with some sweetness work really well as blue cheeses. When you try this one, it has a little touch of bitterness as a result of the veining, which can be really well offset by um, the sweetness in a dessert wine or a fortified wine. And they can also, in comparison to something like, say, the brie style or the goat's cheese, 
they can be kind of much more powerful. So you need something that's got enough guts to be able to stand up to them. Um, bizarrely, in the last few years, I've um, been told again and again, and I have actually tried it, um, sparkling wine, so champagne can work really well with blue cheese, which the first time I heard that, I said, absolutely not. But it does actually work really well. And I think it's got something to do with the bubbles that you have in blue cheese. And also, if any of you have got a blue cheese in front of you and a glass of Sauvignon Blanc, try those together as well. Because um, again, it's the, some people absolutely love this combination. It's that high acid in the blue cheese and the really high acid in the Sauvignon Blanc that match together. And some people just find that that really helps to lift the, um, lift the, the wine and the cheese combo. For me, uh, I prefer Sauterne, I prefer sweet, sweet white wines. Um, I know one member, Mike, was saying that he had his with a Pinot de Chiron, and the Pinot kind of ever so slightly, I think you were saying overpowered the blue cheese, which I could see. Pinot de Chiron is, um, I normally say best served as an aperitif, but I had it on my honeymoon and um, I had to go to bed an hour later and I didn't reappear. So perhaps not, perhaps better at the end of the evening just to sip a very, very small glass, very cold. Um, we've been asked, Ben, whether you could possibly talk about ideal temperatures for serving cheeses. Mm -hmm. um, so remember, it really likes the Baron by God crawling off the plate, but yeah. um, he would thinks that they would like the gorgonzola a little bit more chilled. What do you think? Again, I think it's subjective. Um, uh -huh. However, when it comes to, for example, bar and by God, mine looks like this. Um, it's not fully it's developed. Beautiful. It, 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 it is, it's stunning as it is, but it's not fully, it's not fully developed. Um, and, and you would expect it, uh, you know, if you want something running off the plate that it's completely you know, at the end of its life. Um, with, a, with a soft cheese, I, I like it on the colder side. So I would take soft cheese out of your fridge um, later than my hard cheese. So hard cheese, Wescom, for example, um, I would take out um, an hour and a half to two hours before I want to eat it. And also it depends on the size. If it's 250 gram piece, um, so tonight you had a 125 gram piece, you, don't, you need to take it out 45 minutes before. If you have a, if you have a 500 gram kilo piece, um, I, I would recommend two hours before. Um, with softer cheeses, I prefer them um, a little bit colder. So I prefer them taken out of the fridge maybe um, half an hour, 45 minutes before. So soft cheese, half an hour, 45. Hard cheese, um, I would say, an hour and a half to two hours, depending on how big your piece is. If it's this size, 45 minutes to an hour. Um, blue cheese, it depends on the blue cheese. Um, if you have a soft blue cheese, uh, again, I prefer soft cheese and, uh, and soft blue cheese um, on the colder side. So again, about 45 minutes. If it's a hard blue cheese, Stilton, uh, which is a territorial, we would say, Stilton a territorial blue. Um, we would say probably an hour, an hour and a half. Does that help? Is that, is that okay, Emma? No, that's fantastic. I'm sorry I had to mute myself because um, our next door neighbour has decided to set off a load of fireworks. So I do apologise if that's um, <laughs> causing havoc with anybody's sound. And I'm expecting it in a moment to cause havoc with the dog who's... Um, also really desperately wanting some of my blue cheese and is not getting any because I'm bringing it. Um, so just trying to look and see what other questions that we've had going in. Um, bear with me one second. That's okay. So somebody has been asking, what do you think Ben about having a cheese board with all the different, so tonight we've got lots of different kinds of cheeses. Would you recommend a cheese board or would you just go for one cheese that was particularly good? So I find it really fascinating having um, one 
um, one type of cheese, so one style of cheese. So having a territorial board. So in a territorial board, you would have Applebee's Cheshire, you'd have Kirkham's Lancashire, you'd have Cornish Yard, and you'd have Galworth Caffili, and you could also have Duckett's Caffili. And they are territorials. And it's so interesting to taste through this. They're all crumbly, dry cheeses, for example. Or you could have, you know, um, a cheese board that is full of soft cheese, and you could have Baron Bygold versus, like, versus Breeder Mo. Um, and then you could have San Marslan and San Jude. Um, mm-hmm. And you could have that kind of board. Um, and I think if, if you're wanting to look further into cheese and, and explore it further, then that's the way to do it. Um, if you're doing it for friends, then I would say, you know, you make it you make it pretty easy. You have a, I think you always have to have a goat's cheese. They're just they're so decadent, they're so beautiful. A goat's cheese, um, a hard cheese, and then you have a a blue, um, or a soft. Um, so, I don't know. I, it's tricky for me because I, I would have all cheese. <laughs> so, um, I have. Had, but then you could have goat's cheese, and you could have a goat's cheese board, and you have, you know, a couple from France, and you could have a couple from England. And we, we've got some amazing, you know, British goat's cheese suppliers, uh, producers. And Norton Yarrow in Oxfordshire, they make the most stunning lactic set goat's cheese. It's, yeah, it's absolutely amazing. They, they make Cinnamon Hill and Brightwell Ash. And they're just two cheeses that, if you ever see, you really should buy because they're. Yeah, the best that the British do. They're, they're amazing. Fantastic. That sounds really interesting. I like your idea as well with kind of sticking to one style of cheese on a board because that makes it... I mean, being in the wine trade, we always come at every single thing we do from a wine point of view. And um, so for me, it's, it's so much easier just having one style of cheese because then you can have one wine that just works really well across the board with that particular style of cheese. But when you have a, a blue, a cheddar, a goat and a, a bloomy rind, it, it's impossible to have, as I think hopefully we found tonight, um, even those people who've gone, oh, I'm not entirely sure about your choices that you hope to own or, um, you know, I would have gone for this something a little bit different. Hopefully everybody agrees that there's no necessarily, not necessarily one wine that would work with all of those cheeses across the board. Um, I think if um, somebody did ask, you know, if you had to have one wine with all those cheeses, what would you go? And I thought, gosh, um, it would be very, very difficult, but I think I might actually have something that's not here at all and possibly go for something like a Chablis. Um, so something kind of very, very dry, quite minerally, high acidity, but it wouldn't match everything perfectly. And that would make me a little bit sad. <laughs> <laughs> but, but you went white. And as we all know, white wine goes with cheese. <laughs> it does. It does. If that's the only takeaway from this evening, then white wine and cheese is the definite way forward. <laughs> Excellent. So I think the um, the final question of the evening came from somebody saying, why charcoal crackers <laughs> um, versus, um, gosh, all the other different flavours of crackers that one might have? So our charcoal crackers are our most plain crackers. So we have, um, so Fine Cheese Company and Artan Biscuits, we are sister companies. We're owned by the same gentleman, very lovely gentleman called John Siddle. Um, and um, he owns our Sam Biscuits and his late wife, Anne-Marie Dias, um, owned the Fine Cheese Company. Um, and unfortunately, I think it was four years ago, um, she lost her life and, um, and, and John took over the Fine Cheese Company as well. Um, and so we have beautiful biscuits and we have, in my opinion, some of the best cheese that you can um, you can get your hands on um, and we we try and do the best we can to you know to to send um, to send both to everyone we can um, and I chose charcoal because it is the most plain of biscuits and we have four extremely different cheeses 
So I can't choose it. You could never choose a, a biscuit to go with each cheese because they're so different and they're so unique and they're so beautiful in their own right. So I couldn't, I, yeah, it, it'd be too, it'd be too tricky. So I went for a completely plain biscuit. That's my reason. I love it. I have to say, I do like the charcoal biscuits and there's something about them that just makes it feel quite healthy. So um, I'm totally up for them. <laughs> I think they're great. <laughs> no, no butter in there. <laughs> no butter at all. No and butter. Um, yeah, as you say, they are, they are very plain. They're not, they don't get in the way of the flavors of the cheese. Yeah. So I tend to eat cheese in a way kind of quite French. I just chop it up and, and quite happily munch on it. But um, yeah. my husband just loves cheese on biscuits. So the charcoal works really well. Yeah. No, no, my, my partner as well, Pip, she, she loves a biscuit. But I, I just eat cheese as it is. But yeah, I always bring biscuits home for her. Unadulterated. <laughs> Absolutely. So, well, I think um, it's probably time for me to say to um, all of those of you watching, firstly, a huge thank you to you, Ben, for coming along this evening and talking to us about cheese. Um, it's funny because I love cheese so much, but I am such a, a novice when it comes to cheese knowledge. Um, so it's really lovely to have these events where I can learn so much about um but what it is I'm eating and why I like it as well. So for me now, it's all unpasteurized from here on in and good quality cheeses. So um, it's been a, a lovely start to lockdown. And um, I do hope that everybody who's watching it has, um, has enjoyed themselves as well. And we've got lots more events going on. Thank you, Linda. They put a little hand up. Um, so yeah, so thank you ever so much to all of you who've joined us this evening. Really do hope that you've enjoyed and also that you've kind of, you've taken away from the fact that it doesn't have to be a specific cheese and a specific wine, but there are kind of general ideas of different styles of wine and cheese that do work together. And I think then we've decided that we're going for a territorial cheese board. Absolutely. Um, which kind of makes me think of a cheese board going back off its mind. But um, <laughs> yeah, just something kind of all the same style and then one wine to match would be absolutely perfect for Christmas. Absolutely, Emma. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's been an absolute pleasure. No, it's been our pleasure. Thanks, Ben. And thank you to all of you. And we hope we're going to see you all again soon. So thank you so much for coming along. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.